Welcome along, everyone, once again. This is Tim Bushong, I'm Pastor of Syracuse Baptist Church. And with me today is one of the speakers at this year's Jesus and Politics Conference, Hail to Jesus, our fourth one. This is my friend, John Moody. John, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Tim. It is so good to see your impish, Tom Bombadil, well-tanned face on my screen. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the first time we met, it was uh, it was under uh, not normal circumstances. A mutual friend said, hey, I've got a, a guy that needs a place to stay overnight because he's on his way to a judo uh, champ or a contest with his son. And I was like, fine, whatever. Then I told another friend of mine, oh, yeah, this there's this guy coming to stay, John Moody. And he just went, whoa, no, he's one of the speakers at the County Before Country. You know, it had a very different focus this year primarily yes, church yes. planting yep. you know planting churches and starting schools were the dominant speakers and theme yeah and that was yeah. um you know it was really cool to hear some of the discussion around that see how people are trying to crack those two very difficult nuts oh, that boy. we're yeah you know trying to get some seeds planted out of yeah I think the uh, uh, they're both related. They both have their own individual issues and problems and things like that. Um, you know, I've I've done the one, but I've never started a, a school, and that's that's kind of my goal. There's a building in our town that's now housing a great big dying United Methodist congregation, and it's yep. an old Evangelical United Brethren. It's it is, dude. We're talking. Oh. God, break the teeth and, well, don't break their teeth, break you know, teeth. there's some. So anyway, uh, of all the speakers this year, let's see, we have two repeats, Joseph Spurgeon, in fact, this is his fourth year, and John Harris, his third, and this year I've asked you to come and speak, and William Wolf as well. The reason I wanted to have you come, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk at last year's County before country. Um, of course, I enjoyed getting to know you when you were sitting in our living room just chatting. And <laughs> I realized, oh, this is another outside the box guy. Um, I can I can really relate. And uh, I'll be honest, I have to struggle sometimes with, okay, Tim, you're not the exception to the rule, just because you've done things all cattywampus and backwards and all your all your corporate friends are going how could you how could you live like that and i'm thinking how could you live like that you know so and one of the reasons i, I wanted to bring is because you've had some actual experience confronting the man or at least engaging with the man and i always think you know being an old schaefer head myself um what is it about the topic of jesus as Lord of the Universe and politics that makes evangelicals just shudder like a uh, a towering, quivering bowl of jello. Why? Why is it that that's our squirrely blind spot? Maybe it's some re reaction to the moral majority. I don't know, but it's still to this day. I've approached my some of my good friends who are pastors. I'll say, hey, you know, helpful if you'd maybe help promote this and share it with some of your friends. And, and they, right, third rail. So, John, yeah. in your opinion, what, what do you think is, you know, where would you hang your hat if someone asked you, why are American Christians so terrified of political engagement? Yeah, so I'd not say it's any one reason. Uh, it, it, there, there's some dominant themes from last 60, 70 years of U.S. history. So you, you have, you know, the seed of the sacred secular divide that was planted, especially in America, in the, um, you know, early 1900s, where, uh, and, you know, what's interesting about that one especially is, at least in, you know, Baptist circles and whatnot, um, and some Presbyterian circles, the the split, I think it was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, that led to the rise of the fundamentalist movement, 
uh, you know, the fundamentalist movement was trying in their mind to reclaim and protect the gospel. But what they basically did was solidify the sacred secular split where, um, you know, Fosdick and all of these heretical preachers who are all about the social gospel, the, the fundamentalists seeded all of that, all of that secular stuff to them. And they're like, we're just going to focus on the sacred, the gospel, the inerrancy of scripture, the Trinity, these core doctrines. Um, and that's so yeah, also where like, the uh, where the the Bible college movement came from. We don't need the university. We'll go to Bible college. Yeah, similar. Yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now you have a college that's just for Bible, and then you have schools that are for secular things. Right. Um, and, and that you know that even has antecedents before the 1900s. Um, but but it really you know see so of that trend. You have as you alluded to. Um, the, the moral majority of the 80s and 90s and how some of that played out and the debacle of our foreign policy under Bush. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that that led to a really strong reaction in evangelical circles in the late 2000s into the 2000s and 10s. Uh, Stephen Wolf and a few other people recently had some great articles on like the Gospel Coalition, the Young, Restless, and Reformed. Um, you, you know, why were they such easy prey for wokeness and wins, you know, winsome ink and whatnot? By the way, um, I'll, I'll share a link to that Chronicles article in this in this video down below. That's that's a must read. Yeah, it's it's really excellent. I've gotten about halfway through. I'm hoping to finish it. So, um, you know, so, and then you have like the pietists in our midst mm -hmm. where like Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, except for of anything that actually matter matters in the temporal realm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like he, he's King of Kings, but not of your local County commissioner. He's Lord of Lords, but not of the department of education. That that's Satan's domain, um, you, you know. So it's a it's a really toxic mix of multiple problematic views, and then you're dealing with people who sometimes are only very heavily into one, but sometimes they're infected by multiple of these strands of bad theology. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'll tell you that's that was one of the motivations to have the first Jesus and Politics conference was to try to clear up some misunderstanding because what you just mentioned, all, all of those kind of work together as a a bad jambalaya, and every ingredient's been left out in the sun, and they used sun baked mayonnaise to make it. Um, it works to get you look like that. I tell you this. Oh, I'm hungry. Um, bad ideas have bad consequences. And I think these are not, not to get too far afield into what's going on behind the scenes, but listen, Christendom wasn't founded by guys who were afraid to apply God's law to the civil magistrate, quite the contrary. And on, on my desktop, I have a, a, a picture of that, that Norman castle. And I can't remember the name now where most of the day it's, it's, uh, you can't access it because of the tide. And then when the tide comes back there, that thing has stood for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years as a testimony to solidity and the faith. Let's face it, those those people were Christians. They are our fathers in the faith. And yet for some reason, especially the, um, the, the pietistic strain, Jesus is Lord kind of, it, it's what uh, Joel Webbin called the the already but not really, you know. <laughs> I like <laughs> which that. Is, which is, a, a, I think, a good way. Of, I, don't, I don't think it mischaracterizes either. I don't think that's a straw man. So what has been your experience in, in um, be involving yourself in a positive way so that everyone benefits, your neighbors, your unsaved neighbors, benefits from a healthy local, say, county commissioner, or sheriff or mayor, whoever. Yeah. So 
goodness, what all would be good to share here? Because <laughs> some of it, some of it, you know, I, so, you know, I went to seminary, I graduated 2005. Okay. And, and why, it was while I was in, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, YRR is beginning to ascend, Young Restless oh, oh, you know, like my seminary life was being surrounded by the young, reformed, and restless yeah. guys yeah. in their 20s. That was su- um, Southern Southern in Louisville, correct? Yeah. You know, let's, let's name names. Let's yeah. name names. Come on. So, yeah. Yep. And, you know, while I was at, while I was in school, um, you know, it was probably around 2002 or so where, you know, I guess we're in the second Iraq war. Mm-hmm. Um, and I began, you know, so I'm studying we're doing all of this historical study, languages, church history, theology. And I come across uh, Christian justice. So, you know, for, for listeners' background, I did not grow up a Christian in any way. We were nominally Catholic. I was an altar boy only because I got paid to go to church sometimes. And I could wear shorts under my cassock. It was like the greatest deal ever. <laughs> like um, a news anchor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, so, you know, so I, the Lord saves me when I'm in college. I go to seminary to learn theology and church history. And I started to come across things in my studies that caused me real consternation with um, some of the political views my peers and churches are espousing. Um, you know, you know, so so I'm the kind yeah. of person who probably yeah. really could have easily went like full liberal if the Lord had not really saved me because I was very anti, anti um, very vocally anti war. Yeah. Um, you know, so I come across Lou Rockwell and Gary North and all these right. guys. Right. Um, you know, I went, I went through my cringe libertarian state, as me and my friends now call it. Um, can, can I confess? Uh, Ron Paul's the only politician I ever sent folding money to. <laughs> That's I, funny. I went through it myself, John. And, and during the same time period, 06 yeah. to 09. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, so I, I already was a bit of a fish out of water um, because I, I was very vocally like anti George Bush in the sense of wasn't saying you couldn't vote for him. But the unwillingness for Christians to apply Christian theology to our foreign policy was was baffling to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess it was like Romney who might have ran in 2004. Maybe that was 2008. Hard to remember. Yeah. And um, oh, you McCain, know, a bunch of my... McCain was 08. Romney was 12. I okay, think. yeah, so maybe it was McCain, I, and like, yeah. you know, all my friends were like, aren't you going to vote for McCain? <laughs> and I go, no. And they're like, and, you know, this idea that um, just because you're a Christian, you don't have to vote Republican. Um, I say this as somebody who might have voted for Trump twice, because I'm not saying you can't vote for imperfect people. Exactly, um, yep. You know, but that's a that's a different issue that maybe will come up at the conferences here, Um, because I think there's a number of as long as you're internally consistent, I think Scripture lets you adopt a number of views vis-a-vis voting. As long as you're consistent with those views and don't judge other believers, I don't have a problem. Um, But what really kind of propelled me into having to engage with um elected officials was uh, I started a local food buying club in 2006 and in 2011 the Kentucky Department of Health raided us Mm. and they raided us because from around 2003 till about 2014 the federal government was pressuring state agricultural health and similar agencies to crack down on um, any alternatives to the conventional food and farming system. Um, So there's 
all kinds of crazy videos you can go watch on the internet of like SWAT teams right. raiding Amish or hippie co-ops. Yeah. And uh, there's a farmer in Kentucky. Um, he, he was literally driving his truck to make a delivery of milk to people. And he was raided by like five different agencies and full body gear, body armor and stuff pulled out of his truck. Um, just totally crazy, crazy things. Um, and I think, so I think the, uh, the cartoon equivalent is when Henrietta, the hen goes into the big city and Porky chases her to get that egg and <laughs> she's protected and the mafia is out to get, Oh no, the coppers. And she goes, land sakes, all this trouble over one little egg. <laughs> we should do a meme video about that kind of attitude. Cause we, we have the same thing here in Indiana. We're in the hillbilly country farm area. Yeah. It's, oh. it's really wild. Um, I, you know, in my adult life, there's only been, I think, three times I've ever been credibly threatened with harm by somebody. Mm -hmm. And one of those was the Kentucky Dairy Association threatening me and a few friends with physical harm for pushing a bill um, that would give consumers choice over who they get food from that okay just folks if if you're not paying attention need to pay attention right now just think how insane that world the worldview is that prompted those actions and responses can you imagine any Recently, uh, Al Sharpton said, oh, can you imagine uh, Madison or Adams, uh, you know, trying to overthrow the government? Said, wow, it's civics. Uh, <laughs> uh, but can you imagine either of those guys envisioning a day when the state government would have the kind of authority to come in and tell you what you can or can't consume as a <laughs> or sell as a farmer? Yeah, well, you know, so years ago an organization sued the FDA over the interstate ban on the transport and sale of raw milk. Yeah. Um, so that's not actually a federal law. It's a, a, a position promulgated by the FDA. And so they were sued over this position. And in the lawsuit, um, I might not quote it exactly, um, but the FDA in responding to the lawsuit said there is no fundamental right to choose what you eat and who you get it from, nor is there a fundamental right to choose what you feed your family. Um, well, well, what makes this even more <laughs> ironic is there is a similar lawsuit, I believe it was in Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so just at the state level and the attorney in that case, um, you know, I don't think the FDA's language went quite as far as what he said. So it's a little softer than what I quoted, probably. But he said in his ruling that there is no fundamental right to food, like at all. And then he, not just a few months after he makes that ruling, he, he steps down as a judge and is immediately hired by Monsanto to be one of their counsel. You know, I, I was just thinking right right before you mentioned that that case always follow the money how many times yeah. Yeah, have you ever now, now you're a little younger than i am I, i'm 62 you're you're 35 you know something like that i don't know what you are I no 45 idea. i turned or, 45 oh, oh. Days. well hey, hey uh again Warner I've brothers. these gray hairs warner brothers clean living <laughs> son cecil <laughs> turtle when he beats bugs bunny clean living oh. um <laughs> It, it's one of those things that as, as an older man, you you learn lessons and then you have to relearn lessons and then you relearn again. Weren't you paying attention? Young man, you should have been paying attention. Follow the money and the, the control over what people eat and consume and drink on the industrial scale that we have today. I, I mean, have you been to Walmart recently? It the i'll just leave it there because it's easy and cheap 
and quick and it's loaded with sugar and sodium and things that your body just goes ooh, ooh. <laughs> i want more of that you know well okay so let's let's bring this around to how christians uh perceive of this government entity wouldn't you agree that the 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 uh kentucky dairy what, what are they called the dairy well, like I forget, you know the dairy dairy men? organization we're the highway yeah. men well we're the dairy men we're fully armed too because you know <laughs> you might be drinking raw milk by the way we have some families in our church and that the the cream the heavy cream that they bring up and <laughs> oh it's so good man what's going on you know um so, so think about how this would be un completely untenable to even a, like a children's book, like the ox cart man, who all year, he and his family are working, they're planting, they're harvesting, the little boy makes birch, uh, birch brooms, um, the spinning uh, uh, flax into linen, making shawls, and then at the end of the year, he hitches his ox to the cart, he goes into town, he sells it all, he sells the ox because he's got a young ox in the barn back home, and he sells the cart. And what he buys is an iron kettle yep. and a new uh, darning needle. And he, then he turns around and walks back home. None of those exchanges were uh, regulated or overseen by any other entity other than the ox cart man and the people with whom he's doing business. Yeah. And that's to answer radical. Your, yeah. Yeah. Well, and to answer your earlier question, why Christians should care about that yep. is that that story perfectly encapsulates one of the main reasons why is the ox cart man and his family could obey the biblical teaching on work and not only better their estate through honest labor, but better society at large. That's right. Yes, and 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 what regulation is now doing? Um, it is worsening everybody's estate, so that a very small group of people can have it ridiculously better and better, yep. and it's undermining uh, biblical patterns of work and reward and so much else. So, so yeah. just on a practical level. Um, what you see going on in modern America is very similar to the kind of stuff the prophets decry in Isaiah. Oh, in yeah. Jeremiah, you know, yeah, yeah. Woe, those of you who become rich off the backs of the poor. Yeah. Um, you who run around the markets all dressed up and gilded to the hilt. Because <laughs> um, the cries of my neighbors are the cries I hear, and they're the cries yeah. the Lord hears. Yeah, because my neighbors are impoverished because um, they're taxed out every, you know, you're taxed on everything you do. Um, you know, the money business. that's already been taxed is going to be taxed again on the next purchase of the thing that was taxed before the uh, store got it. And the store was taxed on the property it sits on. It is yeah. nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. I, I realized, you know, sometime in the past few years, I wrote a social media post on this. But on any $20,000 transaction you make, like say you need to buy a $20,000 car. Yeah. The government, between all of the taxes, you know, because there's income taxes on both sides of that transaction. If I want to buy a $20,000 car, I had to earn twenty five, twenty eight, maybe thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then the person who sold the car, whatever, they're getting taxed on the profit, and then there's the sales tax, and you know, and I'm just like, I'm like, it's astounding that you know our forefathers had a little party over. I think somebody once said like, like the maximum amount of taxes the colonists faced. Would have been the equivalent of two to three percent. Right. Right. And and most modern Americans, um, roughly thirty to fifty percent of what you earn goes to taxes. Yeah. And regulations and fees. But you don't notice it because it's 
it's a um, you know nibble here and a slice here and a withholding there and a fee here. And as Ron Paul said, inflation is the hidden tax on savings and thrift. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Well, I think uh, I think that when a when a nation like ours is under judgment and what it what did it happen to the to the old covenant people of God that uh, foreign nations would winnow away the blessings that have otherwise accrued to those people because of their disobedience to God's law. Yeah, we're in a we're in a messed up uh, condition right now. But I'll I'll be honest. Um, I have hope for the future. Um, I don't have the boomer con mentality like some of my friends do. Uh, just because there's 50 stars on the flag doesn't mean there's always going to be 50. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know that. And uh, that's why I I really you know I I, I follow you on on uh, Twitter and Facebook, and I know what you're doing on the farm. It's hard work, man. There's no question about it. And just think of the the. I know not not everyone can own land to that degree. I'm myself. I'm like. I'm like the English aristocracy, you know, lots of holdings and property and uh, barely a, a, a pound to pinch, but <laughs> no, it's not like that. But, um, you know, w w let's, let's close and tie it up with this. What, what one piece of advice, what recommendation would you give to the average Bible-believing pew sitter out there who's going, I just don't know what to think about this anymore? Well, what would you say to them? Well, what's the this? Just like what's going on in the nation? What's mm -hmm. going on politically? Because, uh, you know, what you think about this, this is what God's judgment looks like. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, um, e even for those who don't believe this is possible, this is what covenant curses look like. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. military defeat. Yeah. It is your substance being eaten up at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's the land Baron, being polluted by the barrenness. blood of the innocent. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and it's and it's as you alluded to earlier, it's everything leads to Romans one. Yeah. Um, this is what the wrath of God looks like. It is children in your local schools pretending to be animals. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you know, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. <laughs> um, don't, don't go quoting the classicals here. You know, the classics, <laughs> man, <laughs> our audience is a bit more, uh, down, uh, homespun than that. Alas. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you I, know, so, yeah, you know, so I mean, you know, um, the good news is, as Ecclesiastes says, uh, G God's wrath is a seasonal thing. There is a time for tearing down and a time for building up. And we as believers need to, um, you know, basically be creating, uh, what's the word like? Refuges. I think, um, you know, our churches, our communities, right. politically, economically, socially, in in all the ways that we're called to be salt and light, we need to be making, you know, regions of refuge um, that people can flee to during this period of judgment. Yeah. Um, and then be ready when uh, God relents and finally turns his hand uh, to, you know, take back over. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, fill hopefully the gaps. Now what? You know, that's it's. I, I love that refuge or sanctuary. Uh, just like your household, my household, we we always treated it as this is this is not the same as the pagan world. This is that mm -hmm. stuff doesn't isn't allowed here, and and yet it was our. Any time you would come over, we were usually having a great time yucking it up and and just really enjoying. Now our kids are all grown. I got, you know, my grandson's your son's age, so season yeah. <laughs> of life thing. But I, I love that idea also of you take dominion first where you can, disciple where you can. Uh, your household is an outpost of the kingdom. 
then apply that to the local church that you're a member of, uh, bring reform where you can. Um, and then let's spill out into the local towns and townships. And uh, I, I would just love for our local chief of police to say, nope, not here, not in my backyard. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's what it. the psalmist, you know, the psalmist says, blessed is the nation whose God, God is, is the Lord. Is the Lord. Yeah. And he's, he's not, you know, obviously that applies to Israel. Yeah. But he wasn't, he didn't say blessed is Israel because God is their Lord. The psalmist right. says that swear. Yeah. Any, um, any ethnos whose God is Yahweh is going yeah. to be blessed. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. It's like any town, any city, any county. Mm -hmm. Um, it can yeah. be a place blessed by God. That's right. By having people who fear him and in the roles and opportunities and spheres he has delegated, they serve him. That's right. Um, I don't I don't understand why that's radical to people. It's like the magistrate is a minister of God. You know, Romans that's thirteen. Right. It's a, the, a, guess guess what my guess what my sermon passage is for this coming Lord's Day? Romans thirteen, one through seven. Oh, fun! Are you working what? through the Book of Romans? Yeah, uh, this will be this will be number seventy-two, so you can see. I know, I know, uh, it seems like a lot, but boy, sometimes two verses is a sermon because of all oh. the implications. You know, was it Martin Lloyd Jones who preached Romans for ten years? There, there's some famous, <laughs> probably. Like, like, some of his sermons would be one word I heard. Like, like he's working through, you know, yeah. he, he's like, I'm preaching one word this Sunday. Right. Well, I, I was that uh, last week was the, the end of chapter 12 and it's, you know, ends with overcome uh, evil with good. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Of course, Spurgeon had a huge three point massive sermon on that verse. So. Well, listen, John, it's been really good to talk with you. I can't wait to see you again. Um, are you planning on bringing some of your uh, your clan with you? I don't know. They seem, they, they seem like they want to come, don't they? You know what? Uh, I, I have a big, beautiful, old-growth woods that, I don't know if you saw it or not, but we have a church video coming up Thursday it was shot in that woods. We had some folks that are newer members, hadn't been to our home yet, and they were they were walking in the paths, just looking. They were like city slickers in Manhattan. <laughs> and we've never seen anything like this. So, with, and then October twenty first is is the height of autumn. You know, uh, just gorgeous around here. You sometimes it's a it's really golden. Everything takes on this golden hue, and it's just magnificent and i'm with my daughter uh I, i'm i'm getting the pumpkin pumpkin spice stuff not getting this stuff's horrible anyway <laughs> <laughs> well hey uh thanks again john we really look forward to uh hearing you speak um i i love your public presentations i think you do a great job and the content is just stellar so uh we'll see you october 21st for jesus and politics for hail to jesus Register at the Eventbrite site. Um, I got that linked below as well, plus the article from Chronicles Magazine. John, have a great day. Bye, kids. Great. Bye, Pastor Tim. Bye-bye.